Last lesson, we covered the cognitive reasons for certain effective patterns being prevalent in the sentences of great writers. This time, we'll get into that phenomenon at the level of phrases, rhythms and patterns within phrases, and schemes of repetition within sentences. Like music, sentences have rhythm, so it should follow that, like good music, good sentences have good rhythm. With great writers, sometimes you can just hear the mastery and the rhythm of their sentences if you read them aloud. Sometimes you don't even need to read them aloud. I could read Virginia Woolf all day and never care if I understood a word of it. She has such a mastery over the rhythm of her prose, it almost begs to be sung. F. Scott Fitzgerald, for as much as I'm not the world's biggest fan of his command of story elements, I cannot deny he composed The Great Gatsby with a level of rhythmic mastery at the sentence level that is rarely achieved. All of this can't be taught in a single lesson, that's for sure. Or even a series of them, for that matter. But it can get you thinking about rhythms and patterns in prose and help you to start building a solid foundation. Parallel rhetorical or rhythmical elements come in many forms and rhythms, and these constructions generally fall under the broad term isocolon. Like beats in music, sentences proceed through time, one beat after another. The basic unit in prose, as in poetry, is the syllable. And we'll start our look at the syllabic rhythm of prose by focusing on perhaps the commonest of rhetorical schemes, the tricolon. Tricolon. You've seen tricolon a lot in stories, in textbooks, and in this sentence as well. As a matter of fact, that last sentence was a tricolon. Let's look at it again. You've seen tricolon a lot in stories, in textbooks, and in this sentence as well. Lists of three things are so common that a mention of two items rarely seems complete without the third. And as the prefix tri in tricolon denotes, this construction is about lists of three. But there's something else about that tricolon we started with. It's arranged in a specific rhythmic way. Look at the number of syllables. In stories, in textbooks, and in this sentence as well. Three, three, and seven. And just so you can't accuse me of fabricating this silly idea, here's Melville doing the same thing while describing the burst of a whale's jet on the horizon. But calm, snow white, and unvarying, still directing its fountain of feathers to the sky, still beckoning us on from before, the solitary jet would at times be descried. Can you feel the rhythm in that initial tricolon to start the sentence? Calm, snow white, and unvarying. That construction is often called an ascending tricolon, or sometimes a tricolon crescendo. Musicians will be familiar with that terminology, which signals to a musician to play gradually louder. Whenever a musician sees the crescendo symbol written on their sheet music, they're supposed to play gradually louder. Similarly, writers make their syllable count grow longer in a tricolon crescendo. If it sounds complicated, don't worry, it's not really that complicated. It boils down to this. If you have a list of three things, you put the shortest item first, the next shortest next, and the longest item after the conjunction. For example, let's say that you're writing about George and Myra, who are looking to adopt a dog from a shelter. They've narrowed their choice down to three breeds, Basset Hound, Pug, American Terrier. You could put those three breed names in any order, but it's probably best listed like this. George and Myra couldn't decide which breed of dog to adopt, but they'd narrowed it down to a pug, a basset hound, or an American terrier. Piece of cake, right? Just as in music, when you play louder, you can play softer as well. The opposite construction, not surprisingly, is called descending tricolon, or tricolon diminuendo, or decrescendo. And also, not surprisingly, it works from the longest item to the shortest. As we were plummeting, all I could think about was the warning sign posted at the roller coaster's entrance, grave bodily injury, heart palpitations, or death. You can probably hear from that descending tricolon that this construction is an excellent choice when you really want to emphasize that last item in the series, grave bodily injury, heart palpitations, or death. It may or may not come as a surprise to you, but many great fiction writers, at least implicitly, pay close attention to the rhythms and patterns in their prose, but they do. Often the best word choice isn't just about selecting a word with the precise meaning. Sometimes it's about the sound and rhythm of the word, too. 
Finding a balance between the right meaning and the right rhythm in a sentence can be a critical part of revision. Patterns of repetition. Repetition is another common element in great writing. Similar to parallelism, repetitive patterns are easy to recognize and process, and sometimes they allow a writer to play with the rhythm in the same way a tricolon or similar list does. They come with complex technical names like anaphora, polysyndeton, chiasma, a panalepsis, and other ridiculous titles I wouldn't suggest you learn. What's important to understand is that, like parallelism, these repetitive patterns usually just share a similar grammatical construction or word, like beginning a phrase with the same word for effect. All that most maddens and torments, all that stirs up the lees of things, all truth with malice in it, all that cracks the sinews and cakes the brain, all the subtle demonisms of life and thought, all evil, to crazy Ahab, were visibly personified and made practically assailable in Moby Dick. Like repeating the same word to emphasize the diversity within a category, there were contestants wearing gorgeous evening gowns, contestants wearing tight jeans and cute little 80s-style tube tops, contestants wearing perfectly form-fitting black ballet leotards, and I was the contestant who looked an awful lot like a pear wearing baggy green scrubs and a brownish green top that wasn't nearly baggy enough to hide the ten years I had on all these younger girls. Like repeating the same conjunction to connect words or phrases for various effects. They were nearly all whalemen, chief mates and second mates and third mates, and sea carpenters and sea coopers and sea blacksmiths and harpooners and shipkeepers, a brown and brawny company with bosky beards, an unshorn saggy set, all wearing monkey jackets for morning gowns. Like repeating the same word at the end of the clause. In their waking hours, all the Warsaw Four could think about was chess. They calculated chess, they contemplated chess, they cogitated chess. And at night, when they couldn't stay awake any longer, they dreamed chess. Like repeating different forms of the same word within the same clause. My grandfather was fond of saying that a school of divinity never made a man divine, just as a scientist never made science, and a mountaineer never once made a mountain but a drinker often made a drunk, which must have seemed achievable to me, for that's what I became. Like using similarly constructed modifiers. I've had it up to here with that bug-eyed, pig-headed, donkey-faced judge. Here's Melville dropping one of these into a description of wild horses. Most famous in our western annals and Indian traditions is that white steed of the prairies, a magnificent milk-white charger, large-eyed, small-headed, bluff-chested, and with the dignity of a thousand monarchs in his lofty, over-scorning carriage. Again, there are far more ways to generate pattern repetition in your sentences than we can speak about here. This is merely a quick lesson designed to open a door. On rhythm, again, our poet cousins can teach us much. Listening to the rhythm of our greatest poets can only help your prose. Then you might apply the technique of syllable counting where you find your prose getting clunky. There are also far more comprehensive lessons on rhetorical schemes and patterns out there if you're interested in learning more. Rhythm and patterns offer your reader a chance to get in step with the words you've put on the page. Familiar rhythmic patterns help to ensure your reader's cognitive container never gets overloaded, and when done right, they are the unsung heroes of the greatest sentences ever written, hiding there in plain sight, keeping the ideas and images on beat adding a musical, even poetic element to our prose.